In this video, we present some of the key ideas of our 2022 review published in Chemistry, a European journal. Due to a special arrangement between Wiley and the University of Duisburg in Essen, the article is available free of charge and can be found via the link in the video description below. Let us think about making alkenes stereoselectively. Probably your textbook knowledge will immediately point you to solutions like the Wittig reaction for electron-rich Z-alkenes or maybe a Julia-type olefination for E-alkenes. But if we think for a moment about the stereogenic step in these reactions, we see that the selectivity for both methods fundamentally requires some noticeable difference in the substituents. So for the synthesis of higher substituted olefins, this is a problem. If the substituents are too similar in size, how should their steric non-difference lead to some selectivity? But maybe your chemical intuition didn't say connective olefinations immediately, but pointed you towards alkyne additions instead. Here we can employ Zyn carbometallations for the synthesis of vinyl metal complexes that can be converted into highly substituted olefins by cross-coupling and other methods. But now the regioselectivity of the reactions depends on the difference between the two substituents on the alkyne. So how to get around this fundamental problem for the synthesis of apparently simple but nevertheless highly substituted olefins such as this one? Well, stereospecific elimination of a stereochemically well-defined precursor is a potential solution. But if we just eliminate a proton and a leaving group, we run into regioselectivity problems again. A textbook solution for this is provided by the Patterson olefination, where both elimination partners are well-defined. However, now we have pushed back the problem to the preparation or separation of potentially quite complex elimination precursors that have two adjacent stereocenters. Fortunately, this type of elimination chemistry also works with boron instead of silicon. And boron is great for stereoselective synthesis. Just think about the work on carbon atom ligations by Madison and Agarwal, for example. By the way, for this chemistry we also have a review article with a video abstract. But for now, let's look at how boron can be used to make alkenes without using transition metals. So we are not talking Suzuki couplings here, but methods that make Peterson-like elimination precursors. Those precursors can be made diastereoselectively. For example, by adding a boron-stabilized D1 to a classic A1 reagent. In many ways, this reaction is analogous to the Wittig reaction and is thus often called the boron-Wittig reaction. However, it is quite likely that in contrast to its famous namesake, the initial addition product is not an oxaborotane, but rather an open structure. However, understanding the diastereoselectivity of the initial addition is of key importance for correctly predicting the stereochemical outcome of the overall reaction. For Wittig reactions, a transition state model of a 2 plus 2 cycle addition can be invoked. But since oxaborotanes are unlikely intermediates, this wouldn't make sense here. However, in the 1980s, Bassendale and Taylor described a simple model that works surprisingly well for the addition of many prochiral carb anions to prochiral carbonyl groups. The model postulates that the carb anion attacks in such a way that the smallest substituent of the carb anion is placed between the two carbonyl substituents and that the remaining largest substituents avoid each other as good as possible. It should be mentioned that this simple model also predicts the outcome of the classic Wittig reaction correctly. So it should be taken for the simple heuristic that it is, and it might sometimes very well be right for the wrong reasons. Nevertheless, it provides a great framework for understanding the chemistry that we are going to talk about in a moment. For the synthesis of disubstituted alkenes, this means that the erythro addition product is preferably formed, which can then be subjected to zin elimination yielding Z alkenes or to anti elimination yielding E alkenes. However, it also shows that for higher substitution patterns, we will run into similar problems as with Wittig or Julia olefinations. But fortunately, there is a way around this. If the Devon reagent has two boronic esters, vinyl boronic esters with two or even three substituents can be generated with decent diastereoselectivity. 
In a minute we will see that these vinyl boronic esters are incredibly good precursors for tri-substituted and to a certain degree even tetra-substituted alkenes. But for now let's take a brief look at the rationale behind this diastereoselective formation. The overall selectivity of the reaction comes from the elimination of one of the two diastereotopic boronate moieties. However, more often than not this elimination is very fast. Therefore, the exact conformation in which the intermediate is formed can still be decisive for the question which elimination does occur. And again, we can employ the Bassendale-Taylor model to predict this initial conformation. And from that on we can work our way towards the answer which boronic ester is preferably formed. Morgan was the first to invoke the Bassendale-Taylor model for this course and in our review we extend this analysis to other examples as well. We also present another interesting method for the synthesis of vinyl boronic esters by Liu and co-workers which employs an ingenious 1-3 rearrangement. But for now let us move on to the next section. As we just mentioned, vinyl boronic esters are great precursors for olefins with higher substitution patterns. And this is because of a particularly facile 1-2 rearrangement reaction that can occur when their 8 complexes are converted into small heterocycles, thus generating our central elimination precursors in a diastereospecific manner. The most prominent member of this type of reaction is certainly the Zweifel olefination. For this, vinyl boronate 8 complexes can be generated either by reacting vinyl boronic ester with an alkyl metal species or vice versa by reacting a vinyl metal species with an alkyl boronic ester. Either way, an 8 complex is generated that upon oxidation can undergo a 1-2 rearrangement. In the classic Zweifel olefination, this oxidation is performed with a halogen. So keep in mind that the resulting halonium ion is the product of a Zyn addition. The subsequent 1-2 rearrangement furnishes our key elimination precursor. And classically the Zweifel elimination is concluded with a base induced anti-elimination. So this combination of Zyn addition towards the halonium ion and anti-elimination towards the final alkene leads to overall inversion. But 55 years of development on Zweifel olefination furnished methods that allow for Zyn elimination as well. So for a synthetic scheme that aims for tri-substituted olefins by combining a boron-vitic type synthesis of a di-substituted vinyl boronate with a Zweifel type olefination, it does not matter which di-substituted vinyl boronic ester is initially generated as long as it is generated with a good DE. Beyond that, another method has emerged that relies on this type of diastereospecific 1-2 rearrangement. Here the oxidation step and the 8-complex formation are switched by first converting the alkene into an epoxide which is then lithiated in order to form an 8-complex similar to the one above. The 1-2 rearrangement then again leads to our central elimination precursors, which undergo Zyn elimination upon heating. The nice thing about this olefination method is that it can be applied in an iterative manner, which allows for assembling highly substituted olefins one substituent at a time. However, it should be mentioned that epoxide lithiation is not always trivial and issues of regioselectivity can arise upon installation of the third substituent. But remember, disubstituted vinyl boronates are accessible by boron vitic reaction and can be turned into tri substituted alkenes by Zweifel type reactions. Therefore, tetra substituted olefins could be made by subjecting these products to the epoxide olefination sequence as long as the lithiation of the epoxide can be achieved. Unfortunately, it is exactly this type of highly substituted epoxide that can be a bit stroppy in this regard. So what else is there? Well, why not exchange the polarity of the synthons for assembling our central precursor? This is particularly interesting since hopolithiation with chiral diamines such as spartine can deliver chiral carbanions asymmetrically. 
And on the other side, boronic esters with a leaving group in alpha position are key players in boronate homologation chemistry. We actually dabbled a bit in this very area, but it was Paul Blakemore who really hit the ball out of the park on this one. He employed lithiated carbamates on the one hand and boronic esters with a carbamate leaving group in the alpha position. These species form an 8 complex which can undergo a stereospecific 1 2 rearrangement upon which one of the carbamate leaving groups is expelled, thus forming our well known elimination precursors which can undergo syn or anti elimination again. In Blakemore's paper, the starting materials he employed came from alcohols. Primary alcohols were turned into carbamates before they were subjected to asymmetric hopolithiation and thus turned into alpha chiral boronic esters. For the preparation of secondary alcohols, he used an asymmetric Noyori reduction. Carbamate formation and lithiation of the benzylic position led to the necessary carbonoids. So, for choosing the overall configuration of the olefin, this method gives us three different switches to flick. The choice between Zyn or anti-elimination allows for making E or Z alkenes from the same elimination precursors. However, switching the configuration at one of its stereocenters also leads to a switch in olefin configuration. Thus, using the enantiomeric boronic ester or the enantiomeric carbonoid gives you another option for choosing the final olefin configuration. At a first glance, asymmetric preparation of two precursors might seem a bit excessive in order to make an achiral alkene. But, as mentioned in the beginning, the synthesis of highly substituted alkenes is still not trivial at all. So, what is the take-home message from this video, or indeed our review? Some of you might be thinking, well, this is just Peterson olefinations with boron instead of silicon, so why should I be excited here? Well, the key to this chemistry is the stereoselective assembly of the chiral elimination precursor. And for Peterson olefinations, this can be a real problem, especially when higher substitution patterns are targeted. But building up adjacent stereocenters is something for which boron is particularly good. Therefore, it is quite likely that this field will see some interesting developments in the near future. Just think about the possibilities that would arise from the application of classic medicine reactions. If you never heard of this chemistry, maybe press pause and follow the link to our video tutorial on this one. What's important for our considerations here is that the medicine chemistry allows you to assemble two Grignard reagents around a secondary alcohol in an asymmetric manner. And alcohols are the precursors for Blakemore's stereospecific carbonoid coupling. So, could it be possible to convert them into carbonoids and thus generate a sequence that allows for the stereoselective synthesis of virtually any alkene just from a couple of Grignard reagents? Well, not yet. Lithiation of non-benzylic secondary carbamates is quite difficult and boronate complexes don't like it if things get too crowded around this little boron atom. But these problems also arise in boronate homologation chemistry and there are some interesting solutions in the literature which, for example, have been developed by the Agarwal group. While the solution for boronate homologation chemistry might or might not be applicable here, they at least point to a real slumbering potential that can be raised when boron meets the Peterson olefination. So, if you want to learn more about these potential solutions or indeed the mechanistic details we only hinted at in this video, check out our review article in Chemistry, a European journal. Chemistry is a well-regarded journal, but nevertheless, the article is available free of charge, as the University of Duisburg in Essen was kind enough to pick up the open source bill on this one. But if you feel more like watching another video, why not take a look at the video abstract of our review on homologation chemistry, which could be used for assembling the central elimination precursors discussed in here. Or take a deeper look into our epoxide olefination chemistry and learn about its development and iterative application.